John, you had a question? Um, I didn't have a question. <laughs> oh, I thought you could then, but. Um, so for the, the student career experience program that I saw on the mm -hmm. slides, um, how, how often are their positions open? Let, let, me, let me talk about that at the end, and I'm gonna be selfish about wanting to do that, not because I'm trying to keep you here till the end, um, because when we introduced that almost two years ago, was at the same time we started using a different authority, that's uh, SCEP, SCEP, Student Career Something Program. That's when we started the uh, SCIP, Federal Career Intern Program, somewhat different for bringing people on, but I want to talk about them in totality and show you some numbers about how many people we brought on board as a result of the SCIP program. And I got a slide that shows that number um, later on, somewhere towards the end. Uh, are you getting in? I mean, so I have a question, but you need to get into it just a little bit of the, the, uh, the structure, the organization structure of the FDA. Because when I went online to, and just Confusing, the right? FDA website, I got you know something that's sort of central, but I couldn't figure out what and your office is in relation to the rest of the organization. Right. But, but before we start, because I don't have any slides talking about that, so let me take some time now to. Um, uh, to talk about that now. FDA is um, divided into, now I guess I could say, seven overall centers, and I refer to them as centers. Our Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, our Center for Veterinary Medicine, our Center for Biologics, our Center for Devices and Radiological Health, uh, Center for uh, Drugs, Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. There is a new center now, uh, uh, plus an NCTR, National uh, Center for Toxicological Research, that's in uh, Arkansas. FDA has a new center now, and I'm going to talk about that one later on specifically, and that's the Center for Tobacco. So, so that sort of makes up the full. And then there is the Office of Regulatory Affairs, we refer to it as ORA. And that organization is where the field structure falls in. So we have the headquarter component to ORA, and then uh, the field structure is the field structure divided amongst five regions: northeast, central, uh, southwest, middle, uh, uh, southeast, and this region that we're in, the Pacific region. And within each of those regions, you have district offices. Um, for the Pacific Region District Office, obviously it's my office, the Los Angeles District, there's the San Francisco District Office, and the Seattle District Office. Also in this region are two, um, <coughs> we refer to as mega laboratories, and those are um, the Pacific Region Laboratory Northwest, which is located, hence the name up in the Seattle area, and the Pacific Region Laboratory Southwest. And that's the laboratory that's over here uh, in the building where, where I'm located. Uh, so we fall under <coughs> the field organization within the Office of Regulatory Affairs. So that's sort of uh, the quick and dirty on the, on the structure. On any given day, I couldn't tell you who's heading what unit, what division, anywhere. Uh, with so many changes, it's so fluid that, uh, that that's a constant, constant moving, uh, moving target. And there are a number of senior leadership positions within the agency, within headquarters in particular, that makes that revolving door even more difficult to know who's on first and who's on second, so to speak. So, so in a nutshell, that's what that is. There are about 1,300-ish uh, people in the, in the field, uh, field employees. Um, we have about probably close to 700 maybe in, in the Pacific, Pacific region. Uh, Los Angeles District is the largest field office. Uh, and I don't mean in terms of large as a size of a building that's across the uh, uh, the, the area. Uh, I mean largest in terms of the number of employees, largest in terms of the number of facilities that we have regulatory oversight over, and yeah, just making it a more personal one. Uh, largest in terms of the population to which we, uh, within the Los Angeles District span of control. Uh, my office covers all of Southern California and the state of Arizona. Now I'll show a slide on the number of respective zones in those two, in those two geographical um, areas.
So that's sort of a backdrop now, if you will, on the the global structure. I mean, we could literally talk structure for for days because it's it's um it can be intricate. You've been in the area for a while. Can you say something about how your career trajectory came to this position? Okay, I could say fizzling out, but I won't. <laughs> I won't. It's still growing. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me just say that I started working for FDA when I was six years old. <laughs> so when I tell you I've been working for FDA almost 27 years, you'll know. <laughs> you'll do the math. Uh, now I've been uh, over 26 years uh, working for the agency. I started. Um, uh, as a microbiologist, uh, working in the then named New York Regional Laboratory. Uh, and I did that for about uh, nine years. I enjoyed science. Science, I knew from here that I was going to do something in science because for me that is, that is something that I, I had a, uh, a love and fondness for. So I uh, did that for about nine years, and I became a supervisor in our chemistry, um, in our food chemistry um, unit. And I was there for about three years, maybe? 1995, about three years. Following that, I became the director of our import operations in the New York district office. Uh, so I was there for about five years, and then from that position in 2000, I transferred out here. Um, as director of the Los Angeles District Office. So I've been, uh, when I look at it, I've been in FDA over 25 years, and the agency's a little bit over 20, a little bit over 100, so it's almost amazing. I was almost with the agency, almost a quarter of its history. And I always think back whenever I reminisce with folks who've been, especially the new folks, when I tell them, it's, I remember we didn't have computers. I remember when the phones were like, <laughs> I just remember a lot of those, a lot of those things, and as times have changed, certainly we have adapted and, and are employing more and more um, technology. I, I won't uh, go around the room here. For those who came in, we, I guess it's probably to get started here. Um, at any time, if there's a question, please, please ask it. Either I'll do one of three things. I will ignore you. I will answer the question. I'll say I'll get to that one later on in the topic if it's something that should be coming up. Although I said I will ignore you, please. I'm only kidding, I will not do that. <laughs> Besides, you guys are all blocking the doors. So. Um, so with that, um, it's an exciting time to be in public health. Exciting time because, notwithstanding my fondness for science, it is something that affects all of us. Whether you're an accountant, whether you are a, uh, a laborer, whether you are a doctor. Public health is something that touches us all, and I'm just uh, um, fortunate to be at FDA where we are really, as I like to say, uh, central to a lot of those public health initiatives that are going on. What I want to do is start off with a video. It's about five, six minutes, and you sort of saw who it was before. Yeah. Um, as long as maybe we waited one more minute, because the okay. doors will okay. find, and, and uh, I'll introduce you, and then Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Um, I'm here. Any other informal questions about this? I can tell you what I'm doing after I leave here. <laughs> <laughs> Later on this afternoon, I'll be heading up to Sacramento, and uh, we'll be in meetings this week, or training rather, for Epi, Epidemiological Studies. Mm -hmm. So it's Epi Ready training going on, and uh, just for FDA staff. Or? Yeah, FDA and with uh, um, C. Mm -hmm. So. So we've been going up there, learning how to deal with foodborne outbreak and investigations and stuff. So I can see if I really know what I think I know. So just by that comment, is is the nature of your job now cause you to have to travel a lot, or are you still? No, I always travel a lot. Right. There's always uh, there's always travel. I mean, last week I happened to have been in Sacramento as well for a meeting with uh, our counterparts with the state, and I happen to be going back this week back to Sacramento because that's the location for the training. So but travel seems to always be a uh, busy part of the day. <clears throat> this, oh, you may talk about this, but I'll also be in Sacramento on Thursday for the, um, it's a green chemistry initiative of the Department of Toxic Substances. And uh, this morning I was asked to review a new paper on bisphenol A. <coughs> 
I'm not sure if that plastic cup has any in it, but um, the FDA has been criticized for regulatory, uh, maybe sometimes over-regulation, maybe under-regulation. In this particular case, I can see public advocacy uh, increasing. Uh, and what one gets to see is that that's what drives policy, that the science is. Uh, so giving a fund for science, but also having to be the face of the regulatory agency for, um, how do you juggle those two? FDA is an organization based on sound science. I do know all too often uh, politics interferes with that. And there are, anybody can quote any number of examples in which, poli in which uh, politics appear to interfere with, with science. So the discussion that I'm going to have today is non-political. It's more the science of issues and where we are. Um, I'll, I'll let the bureaucrats and the policy shapers deal with that aspect of it, and, and my, my, my focus is purely the science aspect of it. And I, and I certainly recognize when there are policy decisions that may appear, and I stress that may appear, to be uh, not in line with good science. And I'll give an example, not an FDA example, so I feel, feel free to give an example. I feel free to give an example, it's not an FDA example. I'm going to say two words, global warming. <laughs> Everybody's science looks good, right? But they're on opposite sides of, of the spectrum here. And I don't know if it's policy, politics, or science that's governing that argument. That was a good line. Good good two words. <laughs> I'm not falling on either side on just that those two words elicit a lot of discussion. Emotions. And emotions. So. Okay, uh, some more people may join us later, but I don't want to keep you off uh, later than usual. So it's, it's uh, <coughs> one of the best kept secrets that Irvine has is, is being host to a major facility of the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, you can probably see the building um, anywhere from campus if you can it's just across the San Diego Creek. And I remember when that building was coming up, there was um, promises of strong collaborations with town courts. And uh, we've had several meetings and symposia, and it's through one of those that I, uh, I met Director uh, Alonso Cruz. Uh, I think we, of course, have to do more, and I'm delighted that he's you know, been able to join us uh, today to uh, add one more block in that uh, wall that we're building uh, together as a collaborative uh, program uh, linking research to practice. Uh, he wrote a very strong letter of support for us when we were developing the NIH program and um, we had many meetings with the Nursing Science Faculty and uh, Pharmaceutical Sciences all coming up with public health at the same time. As he mentioned earlier, and for the benefit of those who are just joining us, he's uh, FDA's Los Angeles District Office Director, and his responsibilities include providing executive leadership to one of the largest district offices within FDA's Office of Regulatory Affairs. So he's bringing science to these regulatory issues, avoiding politics as much as possible, but almost inevitably uh, has to deal with it. Uh, implementing, managing, and evaluating FDA's regulatory operations within the district, uh, which includes uh, Arizona and all of Southern California and the port of Los Angeles, Long Beach, and the International Mail Facility. Given that we uh, opened the quarter uh, here receiving uh, white powder and envelopes uh, for some of our faculty, this is, of course, something that we are very thankful for all of the techniques that have been developed in FDA and used to support public health. So it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you and to um, interact with us. And he's going to stay around, I hope, still for long afterwards. So if we can't cover all the questions, you feel free to join us at the uh, uh, 
uh, still had room across in the marketplace. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. And I see the time, and I'm told we have about an hour. Yeah. And I will uh, try to adhere to that hour. Some topics may be longer, some may be shorter. But just note that at any time, if you have a question, please raise your hand because I would bet that that discussion will be more important than what I have to say, with what I have to say up here. So please don't hesitate on that. I want to start out with a, uh, a, a small video clip, it's about five minutes, and it is uh, President Obama's nomination of the FDA commissioner. And this was back in March 14th of last year. But I think it provides a good introduction and backdrop to what I'm going to talk about today because I like the themes on which he's speaking upon. And a lot of those things are things that we are uh, speaking more and more in terms of how we're going about our regulatory procedures uh, relative to public health. So I just thought it was a good, uh, uh, a good introduction. And I was listening to see if he was going to say my name, but <laughs> Hopefully not, but this will play. Click it on the left. Oh. Thank you. I've often said that I don't believe government has the answer to every problem or that it can do all things for all people. We're a nation built on the strength of individual initiative. But there are certain things that we can't do on our own. There are certain things only government can do. And one of those things is ensuring that the foods we eat and the medicines we take are safe and don't cause us harm. That's the mission of our Food and Drug Administration. And it is a mission shared by our Department of Agriculture and a variety of other agencies and offices at just about every level of government. The men and women who inspect our foods and test the safety of our medicines are chemists and physicians, veterinarians and pharmacists. It's because of the work they do each and every day that the United States is one of the safest places in the world to buy groceries, a supermarket, or pills at a drugstore. Unlike citizens of so many other countries, Americans can trust that there is a strong system in place to ensure that the medications we give our children will help them get better, not make them sick, and that a family dinner won't end in a trip to the doctor's office. But in recent years, we've seen a number of problems with the food making its way to our kitchen tables. In 2006, it was contaminated spinach. In 2008, it was salmonella in peppers and possibly tomatoes. And just this year, bad peanut products led to hundreds of illnesses and cost nine people their lives. A painful reminder of how tragic the consequences can be when food producers act irresponsibly and government is unable to do its job. Worse, these incidents reflect a troubling trend that's seen the average number of outbreaks from contaminated produce and other foods grow to nearly 350 a year, up from 100 a year in the early 1990s. Part of the reason is that many of the laws and regulations governing food safety in America have not been updated since they were written in the time of Teddy Roosevelt. It's also because our system of inspection and enforcement is spread out so widely among so many people that it's difficult for different parts of our government to share information work together and solve problems. And it's also because the FDA has been underfunded and understaffed in recent years, leaving the agency with the resources to inspect just 7,000 of our 150,000 food processing plants and warehouses each year. That means roughly 95% of them go uninspected. That's a hazard to public health. It's unacceptable. And it will change under the leadership of Dr. Margaret Hamburg, who I'm appointing today as Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. From her research on infectious disease at the National Institutes of Health, to her work on public health at the Department of Health and Human Services, to her leadership on biodefense at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Dr. Hamburg brings to this vital position not only a reputation of integrity, but a record of achievement in making Americans safer and more secure. Dr. Hamburg was one of the youngest people ever elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine, and her two children have a unique distinction of their own. Their birth certificates feature her name twice, once as their mother and once as New York City Health Commissioner. In that role, Dr. Hamburg brought a new life to a demoralized agency, leading an internationally recognized initiative that cut the tuberculosis rate by nearly half and overseeing food safety in our nation's largest city. 
Joining her as Principal Deputy Commissioner will be Dr. Joshua Sharfstein. As Baltimore's Health Commissioner, Dr. Sharfstein has been recognized as a national leader for his efforts to protect children from unsafe, over-the-counter cough and cold medications. And he's designed an award-winning program to ensure that Americans with disabilities had access to prescription drugs. Their critical work and the critical work of the FDA they lead will be part of a larger effort taken up by a new food safety working group I'm creating. This working group will bring together cabinet secretaries and senior officials to advise me on how we can upgrade our food safety laws for the 21st century, foster coordination throughout our government, and ensure that we are not just designing laws that will keep the American people safe, but enforcing them. And I expect this group to report back to me with recommendations as soon as possible. As part of our commitment to public health, our agriculture department is closing a loophole in the system to ensure that diseased cows don't find their way into the food supply. And we're also strengthening our food safety system and modernizing our labs with a billion dollar investment, a portion of which will go towards significantly increasing the number of food inspectors, helping ensure that the FDA has the staff and support they need to protect the food we eat. In the end, food safety is something I take seriously, not just as your president, but as a parent. When I heard peanut products were being contaminated earlier this year, I immediately thought of my seven-year-old daughter, Sasha who has peanut butter sandwiches for lunch probably three times a week. No parent should have to worry that their child is going to get sick from their lunch, just as no family should have to worry that the medicines they buy will cause them harm. Protecting the safety of our food and drugs is one of the most fundamental responsibilities government has. And with the outstanding team I am announcing today, it is a responsibility that I intend to uphold in the months and years to come. Thank you. I like that. Um, uh, I like that. That was a video clip from the president's weekly radio address that happened last March 14th. Uh, but but it provided a good backdrop into some of the themes that I hope to touch upon this afternoon, and certainly that we have been dealing with um, in FDA um, from the. Let us in 2006, that happened out in California, um, to the tomato situation in 2008. Um, that was again um, out here in, in California. And certainly peanut butter, although the manufacturer was not here, we still had a lot of uh, activity as a result of following up on uh, peanut, peanut processes, peanut butter, and, and all that. And just when you think you know an industry, Something new happens and you didn't even factor. Didn't even uh, come into play. Um, to advance the slide, I guess I'll just hit this one. Okay. okay, that works. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, today food protection. The bulk of it will probably, probably be on food protection and what we're doing as a result of that relative to public health. We're going to talk about enforcement and enforcement as a tool um, to achieve public health. I mentioned earlier the Center for Tobacco. I'll just quickly talk about that law and, and, and some of the things that that center is beginning to do. Um, it is a new center, and I do not know all that it will do ultimately. Uh, I already mentioned I'll talk about some local stuff, local highlights, I'll call them. And uh, the what's new and what's next. And although I say what's new and what's next, when I was looking at it this morning, I started to say, well, that's not really that new. But it may be new to you, so that's how I kept it. It was new and what's next. Um, if you will. Certainly going back up to uh, uh, food protection. Uh, certainly FDA 
needs and needs to maintain a strong food protection plan, certainly to address a lot of the challenges that we are being faced with today. The president mentioned forming a food safety working group, and they are looking at uh, some issues to try and strengthen the food protection net within FDA. Uh, the plan needs to be one that is that addresses food for people and animals. Needs to address both domestic and imported uh, food products, and really needs to look at food safety and food defense. Put that word food defense sort of over here for now, and I'm going to come back with a little story about how it got to be food defense and not what it used to be called, and how, and how words matter. Certainly to achieve a meaningful protection of the food supply, we must uh, view threats of foodborne illnesses through what I call a global uh, framework. Certainly, is there any such thing anymore as domestic foods? I mean, I know California is a huge agricultural state, which is its number one industry still coming from the East Coast. I used to think it was like Hollywood, Disneyland, but agriculture is this industry. So what are some of the challenges that, uh, that, we, that we face in, in food protection? Certainly consumer demands 24-7. You know what, if I want a fresh lobster at 2 a.m., just pulled out of the waters within three hours, eh, we could probably make that happen nowadays. That, that, that rapid consumer, uh, consumer demand. Convenience foods are, are increasing, and I'm saying this for myself. Do we cook anymore? I mean, I don't, I, you know, I could call putting something in a microwave cooking, but we really don't cook anymore, so convenience foods are certainly increasing in popularity. What we spend on food service certainly um, equals half of our U.S. spending, just in our, our consumption of food. We're eating certainly more and more fresh produce, and that is a good thing. Certainly, um, more than 75% of the seafood eaten in the United States comes from foreign waters. Certainly, over the course of the past 20 years, we've been tripling our, our use of fresh produce. When we look at uh, some demographic issues, 20 to 25% of the population is at high risk. And high risk? Um, we're certainly an aging company, aging company, aging country. Uh, it's estimated by 2025 over a quarter of all U.S. citizens will be over 60. Certainly, as medicine gets better, and here is, and here is, for every advance is always going to be something that seems to always can can hurt us. As medicines get better, as transplant technologies get better, as drugs are better at suppressing our immune system to, 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 to deal with illnesses that we are dealing with. That also opens up now the possibility for foodborne illnesses and foodborne diseases, where in a healthy population they may be able to fight off that one E. coli bacteria, but an immunocompromised um, uh, group of individuals, they may not be able to, 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 fight, that, uh, to fight that off. And certainly I have here roughly 4% of the population immunosuppressed and from either disease or medication. So it's a lot of that, um, uh, a lot of that uh, certainly going on. Any food protection plan really needs to address three things. Prevention, intervention, and response. Obviously prevention is at the top because we want to deal with things and build safety right at the beginning of a process or a production. That way we won't have to deal with it on the back end. Intervention, really looking at our inspectional work and really using science to govern our risk-based science decision making on what inspections will do, what classification of products warrant a higher level of, of review. And I'm going I'm to say it's going to appear that I'm contradicting myself and constantly challenging, on challenging ourselves on that. Because peanut butter is what I would have said a low risk product. I mean, does it even need refrigeration? Take it out, spread it out, close it back up, stick it back in the, in the, in the cabinet. 
low risk by almost what anybody would see. But last year we had, as uh, was mentioned earlier, a number of people died as a result of salmonella contamination, as a result of peanut butter, peanut products. So we always have to constantly evaluate and reevaluate what we're calling a, a high risk issue and constantly challenge that because things will change. It's easy to see seafood as a high risk commodity because it's so temperature dependent. I mean, seafood is one of the most highly perishable products out there because the moment it comes out of the water, the composition starts. Whereas other meat, it takes a little bit longer. But with seafood, the moment it's out of the water, it starts decomposing. And certainly response. Uh, how fast we react to things in, in, in dealing with getting word out to, uh, to individuals, to the industry, and, and really to those people who may have the products in, 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 their, uh, in their possession. Response is important because the sooner you respond, the sooner you can start engaging and getting a product back with the hope of lessening the exposure to the problem, to the general public. So response is critical, and early signals are even more important because that can help dictate how soon you respond. Classic coming up in food safety issues, in food issues, we always spoke food safety. Food safety, food safety, food safety. You know, keep hot foods hot, keep cold foods cold, manufacture products using good uh, manufacturing products, uh, have a good sound uh, sanitation program in your facility, all of those foundation for food safety. Following 9-11, we started thinking and looking at food a little bit different. A little bit different. We started saying now we need to speak food security. I'm going to tell you the problem with that in a moment. Now we need, now manufacturers need to know their employee, their employee's background, who's coming into the facility, who's at, who has access to, uh, to toxins, to cleaning chemicals, to the actual food production area, because now we were a nation that was somewhat concerned that the next big one will happen in our food supply. So we started talking food security. Uh, we started talking food security not only in the United States, but overseas, other countries. Hey, Lanza, but that word says food defense. I don't see where it says food security. Here is, remember when I said earlier, words matter? We looked at food security as putting a fence around it, locking the door, knowing your employees. But for many parts of the country, they looked at food security, and here's where it hit me. They looked at food security as having enough food to eat. We're looking at it as put a fence around it, lock it up. Our partners that we were really trying to work with were looking at it somewhat differently. And so, how do we evaluate? What are we really looking at? having enough food to eat, or something else. And what we were really looking at was food defense. Defense of the food supply, which meant something different to other folks, and not the same thing as food security. And they were able to wrap their collective understanding around food defense, hands around that, as opposed to food security, which was given a different connotation. So hence, we've been referring to it as, as, um, as food defense. Okay, there's some cross-cutting themes here. Certainly, when uh, we used to look at food safety issues, um, it was, we only cared about its manufacture and packaging, and they were pretty much done. You know, the marketing people had their thing, it went out, uh, we assumed it was gonna be stored under appropriate uh, conditions, and uh, so now the focus really now is looking at the total life cycle of that product. From you, you, you'll hear this phrase from the farm, from the farm to the plate. When it's in the field to when it gets to your plate, looking at the total life cycle and all what happens to that product in its whole whole chain of things with, 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 with food. Which um, I grew up in the city, so I call myself a city guy. But when I'm standing in the middle of a farm up in Salinas Valley and all I see is rows of produce, it's like, oh my goodness, how does this get to be 
the salad on my plate. And it is a science unto itself. Certainly another cross-cutting theme is target resources that achieve maximum risk reduction. I mentioned earlier, I'm only about the science and using the best science to determine not only the type of uh, analytes we're looking for and how rapidly we can find them, but using the best science to help us dictate what's going to be those high-risk uh, activities that we're going to be focusing on. Rank products based on risk. And I said earlier, and I'll keep saying, you've got to constantly do that. Constantly do that. Food manufacturers are coming up with more and more ways to sell us things and packaging and things. I mean, uh, not, not, not in any endorsement of a brand. It's just only one product I know of. And I don't even know if it's still out there. Starbucks had a product that you can buy a can. And it's a self-heating can you can have hot coffee with. But you can buy the can of the off a grocery shelf. And you can have hot Starbucks coffee wherever you want. Apply that to some other food packaging that may be trying to use that technology to cook food, not reheat food, but to cook food. What if it doesn't get to the right temperature? What if it, what if it stays in that quote unquote danger zone and pathogens start to grow? So we always have to be looking at ranking products based on risk because the uh, food service industry, I always say that they, they always dream of new ways to sell us stuff. And certainly market stuff. Remember that convenience food issue? Because I guess we can't go tired to go to Starbucks now. We gotta, you know, have it with us. Uh, and I already mentioned focus on prevention and intervention. Obviously, you want to build safety in from the start, uh, but at the same time, you want to have a sound inspection process that will constantly be looking in and, and searching out for problems uh, through through inspections and, and educational seminars and the like. I already mentioned integration of food safety, food defense. One is the GMP issues I mentioned about. The other one is the security aspect. I'm using security loosely for the other aspect of making sure that we know where our product is, where it's been, where our, who our raw uh, manufacturing, uh, our, our, our suppliers are, where they get their goods from, what do they do when they can't meet our own OEM, original, uh, original specs. Marrying those two together. And certainly using science and modern technology, I think science has grown and continues to grow. This is the IM, IMHO, in my opinion. Science will always be ahead of the law. Will always be. Because of the uh, ingenious and creativity of scientists always thinking of quicker, better, faster ways on doing things. And I remember, we talk a lot zero tolerance. To me, that doesn't really mean anything. Because what is what was zero tolerance 20, 30 years ago, oh, we can find that real easy now. So I always tell people, zero, to zero tolerance is only uh, precautionary on the times in which you're, you're making that statement. Because now we can go to the parts per trillion level. Whereas before it was parts per thousand, parts per million. I remember parts per billion. Now we can go PBT, parts per trillion level. So, so science is, is always looking for the, uh, always looking for down to the genetic level on organisms. Something that many people don't realize. Whenever there is an outbreak, and whenever there's a, a major outbreak, you, you have a lot of players involved, the locals, the states, CDC, and FDA. And let's say for argument's sake, it's a uh, E. coli 0157 outbreak. When we are going about trying to determine how widespread that is, and we're finding samples and we're getting samples from, from, from patients, um, the one thing that we're ruling and that ties all those together is DNA technology. Because we are, are DNA fingerprinting those organisms and linking them to the outbreak. Something that, whereas in the past it would have been just, okay, we found E. coli, we couldn't tell with certainty if it was linked to the outbreak or not. Now we can determine that if it's linked to the outbreak or not. Some people like to say, well, we're starting to have that CSI effect. It takes a little bit longer than 30 minutes, uh, an hour long show sometimes. Okay, public health impact of the food protection plan. Obviously, better prevention, stronger, reduce chances of, of contaminated products getting out there if you build it up. Uh, 
build the prevention and strong intervention from the start. Clearly, that's where you want to be. But the best of times, things are going to go, you may have some problem. So certainly a faster response and being able to remove products faster. And I'm going to talk about one of the things that we are doing um, relative to trying to get products um, uh, move from, get them off the shelf sooner. I would give extra credit if anyone know what RFR stands for. <laughs> An A in the class, no, I'm <laughs> RFR stands for Reportable Food Registry. Well, what the heck is Reportable Food Registry? I mentioned prevention, intervention, response. How soon we can be notified of a potential problem will dictate how soon we can get to potentially violate a product off the streets. Clearly, simple. So do we know so we can respond? Whereas in the past, we would either find out through um, an inspection that we would do, and you heard the numbers earlier about how few that were being done, or sometimes we make we find out by a trade complaint, either an in-house complaint or a competitor complaining, or sometimes the manufacturer would just let us know what happened after they dealt with it. So what the reportable food registry does um, is makes the responsible party, don't worry about the legal definition of responsible party, it makes the person who becomes aware of the situation essentially. Um, have to file a report to the FDA letting us, know, letting us know, especially if there was a reasonable probability that uh, that article of food, and that's animal and or human food, uh, can have a serious health effect. And that's a monumental difference when you look at public health. Before we would have to go out searching for this. And sometimes it would come to us, sometimes it wouldn't. But now, it puts the onus back on the manufacturer. Those who know if there's a problem, makes them now have to make notice to, 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 to us at FDA through the RFR process. I can tell you this went to effect September 8th. I think that same day, got our first reportable RFR event. And I get these emails every day, well, not every day, day, pretty close to it on things that are being reported as problems that are happening out there. Uh, not everything rises to a full-blown full blown response. Uh, some of them are rather simple to deal with. Others have the potential for being more problematic. And we are on conference calls literally every day. There's a standing conference call every day at 8.30, looking at the RFRs that were reported that previous, that previous day. I'll tell you a story about a funny one that I got. I got one from, uh, that was filed in Arizona, and I'm paraphrasing, but I'm real close to it. And it's essentially saying this is, a, this is in a, uh, I thought it was weird because it was an apartment building in Arizona. And uh, essentially it was like the, uh, the person in 4G is cooking tacos and stuff in her apartment and selling them. <laughs> I laughed. The good thing is, and I have to always look for the good thing and stuff, that that consumer was aware of the RFR reporting kit. Requirement. Bad thing is, they weren't the ones who needed to report. So I was referred to the local issue because that's a local matter. We don't necessarily deal in, in retail like that. So, so it's illegal to, to sell food? That wasn't our issue. Oh. He was just filing a complaint against his neighbor. <laughs> I just laughed because I was like, oh, you didn't know about RFR. <laughs> oh. so, so, anyway, so that is uh, public health is about how fast you can get things done about how fast you can decipher the information that's coming to you. It's about how quickly you can respond once you have an understanding of what's going on. And it's about how quickly you can shift should the evidence or should the conditions warrant. That response aspect is, is um, a critical one. That badge, by the way, is the one that, uh, that the commissioner had. A big badging ceremony, the commissioner gets number one. When problems arise, FDA can take any number of actions to protect public health. 
certainly initially the agency will work with uh, manufacturers um, uh, to correct problems voluntarily. And that is probably the, the biggest way in which we are achieving what I like to refer to as voluntary compliance. Certainly if that fails, legal remedies uh, could include um, asking uh, the manufacturer to recall a product, um, should that not be the action that they decide to choose, and depending on the severity of the problem, uh, we can prepare a seizure action in which we would uh, make a petition to the courts to have a product seized, and federal marshals would affect that seizure, if the recall was involuntarily done. Certainly, products that are coming into the country, uh, that are imported into the country, um, that may be problematic, we can detain them um, and then ultimately refuse them or in, with the refusal they can either export or destroy. Depending on if we think that that importer has a history of trying to cheat, we'll, we'll probably move the sea so we can take control of those products, um, especially if they have a history of trying to circumvent the import procedures. And certainly the agency can take, uh, can take firms and individuals to court uh, to prosecute them when they are deliberately and willfully violation of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. FDA, you know, I always tell people it seems to be between a rock and a hard place. That's probably where we need to be, between a rock and a hard place, because it seems like if, if any one side is happy, then that means that we're probably not doing something right. We're not being the appropriate filter. A strong FDA has credibility with the public. A strong FDA is transparent in explaining its decisions. And a strong FDA pursues creative solutions to problems. And that's something that, uh, that we will always attempt to do. And certainly, equally as important with the backdrop again with public health is that a strong FDA enforces the law. Every company, uh, under our jurisdiction certainly has a duty to comply with the provisions outlined in the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act and its related regulation. Uh, certainly to meet the standards, those standards, FDA uh, publishes its regulations that companies move to adhere to. I'm certainly, it, it's, like, it's like almost like being a police force. Uh, doesn't matter how many police officers you have, if the citizenry decided that they were not going to obey the law, that police force would be overwhelmed. So clearly, most citizens are uh, working to comply with the law, as in, as in our industry, as in our businesses. Certainly, the commitment and compliance for many companies, both in terms of their corporate culture, and as well as their investment and compliance system, bodes well for the fact that we would never have the, the, the manpower to uh, to deal with every company if they decided to, uh, uh, to to violate the law. Our goal certainly is that for companies, not only to make an implement uh, commitment uh, to prevent harm to the American people, but to, to do so and actively do so through its not only corporate culture, but through its compliance program. To achieve uh, effective strategy depends on, I'll, I'll, call, I'll say, a few key elements. Certainly, FDA must be diligent. We must, through regular inspections and regular routine inspections, be out there looking for problems. Sometimes problems can arise despite the best, despite the best efforts of companies. But when, but when we find something, we need to uh, certainly be able to follow through with it. And certainly, companies should have a realistic expectation that, uh, that if they cross the line, they will be caught and that we will act upon that. There are, if I know a company very well, it's probably because they have a lot of compliance issues with them. And we need to be able to respond to those in kind. FDA must be strategic. We must put obviously greater emphasis and risk on those things that are riskier. I said it earlier and I repeat often. We must constantly challenge that risk model to make sure that we're always capturing the most current risk. FDA must be quick. Now I already mentioned that being able to respond uh, to violations 
trusting violations that jeopardize public health. Prevention, intervention, response. And certainly FDA must be visible. Agencies uh, must show industry and consumers that certainly not only are we on the job, but we're doing things while we are on the job. Prevention, intervention, and response. Okay, Alonzo, can you show me how enforcement can be a benefit to uh, the public health? Certainly it enables us to catch products, uh, to, to catch and intercept, intercept unsafe products by holding violators accountable. Certainly moves to deter others, moves to deter others from wanting to do the same action. And clearly explain enforcement action inform members of the public of potential dangers. There's one thing to deal with a company and that their products are causing harm, but we would have done little for public health, but we don't inform the consumers as well. So that they know that they have that product in their shelves that they need to, to deal with it. There are times in which we are dealing with recalls that I have the same product in my house. He always debate the borders away or do I keep it for my display? <laughs> Depends on how perishable it is. Enforcement actually can help industry as well because it creates a level playing field because their incentive to want to do something that may be ah, less than scrupulous will be lessened if they think that company a over here is being held to the same standards as company B. So it creates that level playing field. Ultimately, effective enforcement strategy creates public confidence in FDA oversight, which in turn uh, puts trust in the safety of FDA regulated products from eroding. Uh, such, such confidence is critical. You heard mentioned on the video that the uh, United States is ensured uh, one of the safest food safety systems in the, in the world certainly one of, of amongst the safest drug systems in the world because of uh, we're working hard to prevent that, uh, that confidence from, from eroding. We do have our challenges, as in most things. In recent years, the GAO, Government Accountability Office, and others have suggested that uh, FDA's enforcement efforts have not always lived up to the hype. And certainly when you look at enforcement numbers, it's a pure indicator, just the numbers. Over the past several years, uh, they have been uh, going down. And they've been hampered by any, any number of, 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 of things. Certainly the pathways to enforcement was taking way too long. The roadblocks that were there were just taking way too long. Remember the prevention intervention response and how fast you respond, how fast we put that firm on notice, how fast we deal with corrective actions. Um, so, and I, okay, I'm gonna talk now for a few minutes about um, uh, pathways. Pathways to enforcement. And there are, I'll mention five and I'll separate out the sixth one. The six things that Commissioner Hamburg introduced in the major talks he had given before uh, FDLI, Federal uh, Drug Law Institute. I mean, these six fundamental things that will have a big impact on public health with enforcement as a tool. First, FDA is going to set post inspection deadlines. Uh, when we find that the firm is significantly out of compliance, we'll expect prompt, uh, a prompt response from the, uh, from the firm, generally looking at 15, 15 working days, and this will, uh, and we'll do this before we issue any warning letter. And we'll, during that 15 working days, we're preparing whatever regulatory, um, uh, regulatory enforcement tool is still being worked on during that time, and we may use uh, what, they, what their corrective action is to maybe not issue that warning letter, or maybe to use it as a reason why we need to issue it. And during that time, we'll have that we'll have that thing uh, already prepared. Uh, second, we're gonna take uh, steps to speed up the issuance of warning letters. Right now, or in the past, warning letters used to have to go through our Office of Chief Counsel for their review, and blessing, then it would come back down to the district for, for issuance. 
But before that process was implemented, the districts had direct reference on a lot of the warning letters that we issued. So needless to say, one less, we have less review, um, you can issue more of them. And so now we're gonna move back now towards only those warning letters that limit, uh, limit warning to those of significant legal issues, those that are new process, those that are taking a new interpretation on something, those that are new and novel in its approach in addressing something. Those significant things will be going forward through to um, uh, our Office of Chief Counsel for Regulatory Review. And certainly, um, we, we hope that more streamlined process will, will keep consistency with our long-standing practice of the district being able to, to issue direct reference uh, warning letters for what I call the more routine activities. Uh, certainly one of the ones that will probably have a large multiplying effect on what we do. Certainly it's working more closely with our regulated, regulatory partners whether it's with trade organizations, whether it is with um, our state counterpart, whether it's with other government agencies. Um, you heard me mention earlier that uh, last week I was up uh, in Sacramento meeting with our counterparts in, uh, in the state, uh, Food and Drug Branch. We work very closely with them. We do joint work planning. We look at compliance issues together. We have um, uh, we work together on a lot of things, and let me just mention one thing in particular. We had this vision to form a food emergency response team. So when there's an outbreak, we have this team of highly trained investigators and scientists that will be responsible for investigating the outbreak. We didn't know what we were going to call our team, but we know what we wanted to do. So some years later, when we dealt with the spinach uh, outbreak in 2006, uh, that was that team. That was their first major full deployment. And now we, we, we have a name for that team. It's CALFRED, California Food Emergency Response Team. And that group of individuals, and I say highly talented individuals, has received national attention. So much so that that model is being replicated. Uh, by way of a grant, a food, a, a food grant. And that's uh, forming now, well, six, now it's nine RRTs, rapid response teams. So these nine states uh, have grant money to work with their local district office on forming these, these rapid response teams. I don't want to say forming their calculus, but these RRTs, rapid response team. As our ability to be able to deal with and deploy these teams rapidly to deal with, with outbreaks. Because you can imagine that there's a, an outbreak that was traced back to lettuce, and we go to the farm, and we get to the farm and go, well, the farm is now like uh, it's fallow. No, no products are growing. But yet we have to begin our investigation where the product came from. And you really need uh, people uh, trained in farm and field investigations, microbiologists and people other like that in terms of sample collection and evidence collection. I always tell my people that we're collecting samples. I says, if you want to look at it like this, because it ain't that any time we do, someone can challenge us, we'll be in court. Look at it like this. Look at this as us collecting evidence. And if you look at it like that, you keep that in mind, it's going to look to do it the, 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 the proper way. Where was I? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Um, moving forward on fixing enforcement pathways, certainly FDA is going to prioritize its enforcement follow-up. Whenever we are in a situation in which we had to issue a warning letter or something, they had a significant violation, and we had to call a firm in and conduct what we refer to as a as a regulatory meeting, we should prioritize what we do on our follow-up inspection and put that above a more routine inspection. So we already know that there were problems here before, so now we need to follow up and really take a look at where things are and see if they fulfill their commitment to corrective action and seeing how well those corrective actions have taken place. So something in my own office, we are having our case management meetings in which we're looking at the violated inspections in the past and when we're routinely scheduling them for, for, for follow-up. As I've already mentioned on this one, 
be prepared to act swiftly and aggressively to deal with protecting the public. We have been given certain, um, certain tools, if you will, that we didn't always have. So we got more tools following 9-11 as a result of the Violent Terrorism Act of 2002. Um, one of them being um, have access to records and getting these administrative warrants when companies uh, are failing to allow us to, to get certain records. We need to be able to be prepared to, to do those things rapidly, not hesitating. And the, uh, the pretty please, can we have access? If we need the access, use the authorities that we have to get that access, if we, especially if we're dealing with an event that we think has a, a serious, uh, can have a serious uh, uh, public health event. Now, I mentioned that um, there was these five, and then there was a, a sixth one. And a little different from the others. The others were what we were going to do in the event that somebody didn't do something. The issue of warning letter. The sixth one is sort of, I call it the incentive one. The incentive. W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me. Um, and it relates to how firm, how we respond to firm after they make the necessary corrections. Now, because before they do their things and, and they made the correction, there's nothing, they don't have anything, they don't have a receipt from us, if you will, that says, okay, uh, you're clean. So as he is developing, there you We're developing a formal warning letter closeout process that will uh, essentially be based on a reinspection and it'll certainly make sure that the corrective action and the violations have been dealt with. And these closeout letters, if you will, certainly will help to keep the public informed and will indicate on our website once we get this up and formally running um, that these firms have received the closeout letter. Because right now, our warning letters are public information. They are posted on our, our website. And anything that needs to be redacted from them, which is usually not too much, if anything at all, do appear on the website. There's no you know, next step, if you will, that, uh, that shows that they made those corrective actions. So this will be an attempt to try and we hope to think an incentive to, uh, to, uh, to correct those to correct those things. Uh, ultimately, FDA success is going to be determined not necessarily the number of warning letters that are issued or seizures that happen or injunctive actions that happen, but by the impact that we have on public health. And that impact can be through a voluntary recall, could be through working through a manufacturer, could be through a warning letter. The connection between the law and public health is as true for any industry as it is for FDA. And I always say FDA is at the intersection of where science and the law meets. Right there is where FDA is standing, using good science to help us deal with food, drug, cosmetic, and its laws. Certainly when companies fail to meet those standards, FDA needs to be ready to stand up and take the next appropriate step, whatever it's deemed to be based on the problems that are being put before us. Uh, I want to take some time now. Any questions on any of that food stuff? I'm moving away from food stuff. Was this in response to companies complaining that years after they corrected something, their negative impact of getting the letter? Probably. A lot of companies are publicly traded, and uh, they, they certainly tell us that that can have an impact on their uh, board of directors and their shareholders and so forth. Again, my, our focus is the public health aspect and not dealing with those, those issues. Remember I said earlier, politics and leave that out. So that, leave that out. This is economic. That's economic. Yeah. Okay, I mentioned um, tobacco, um, Center for Tobacco. It's a new, um, uh, new center within FDA, and that went into, uh, into law on June 22nd. Uh, took effect, I think, in, I want to say, September 22nd. So just prior to it being enacted, we got a, a, an assignment, a compliance assignment, to go out and to go to each district, I think had to go to five to 10 smoke shops and look for um, flavored tobacco, or flavored, cigars, flavored cigarettes. And I don't, I, don't, I don't smoke. So I had no idea what they were gonna find. 
I had no idea that they were flavored cigarettes. Yeah. Anyway, because one of the one of the things on one of the issues of this new bill dealt with um, uh, preventing youth tobacco use. And these flavored tobaccos has been seen as a gateway to introduce tobacco to younger and younger kids. And so when they were bringing all these samples back, and if you were to close your eyes and someone put the, the cigarette in front of you, you would almost want to take a bite of it because you'd think you're smelling chocolate or the freshest of strawberries or, the, or, or, or lime. That's how flavored these cigarettes were. Now, I don't know what it tastes like when, when you smoked it. Can't imagine it tastes like strawberries and chocolate. Um, but, that, but that aroma was certainly there. And certainly this uh, tobacco control goal, obviously promoting public understanding of the contents and consequences of using cigarettes, uh, preventing youth tobacco, and really helping adults to, uh, to quit. As I mentioned, ban on flavored cigarettes. That's all flavored cigarettes, except one. And I'm struggling to kind of find the one flavor that's not banned. I want to say clove, but please don't quote me. <laughs> but it's that one flavor that's not banned, but most all of the flavored cigarettes are, are banned. Now, I imagine everybody's going to say, you know, I was in a smoke shop the other day, and uh, they had all these other flavored tobaccos out there. So anyway, those samples that we took, that we were collecting, of course, the fear was to get a, uh, a, uh, a baseline of the industry right before the implementation of that, of this, of this law. We'll probably have another assignment sometime shortly to go out and take a look at and see if, in fact, that these manufacturers or these stores have stopped selling uh, flavored cigarettes. Okay, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're looking at, uh, the president said that uh, we were hiring, and we have been. For the past two years, um, we have been hiring. Uh, since our fiscal 08, we have brought on some 84 um, uh, consumer safety officers. Now that number is probably a little bit higher right now for when this line was prepared. And we are still actively hiring to deal with all of the things that we have to deal with. Is that nationally or the other? Oh, the, no, that number is just my office. Nationally, last year I think it was some 600, the year before that I think it was called the 700. Uh, some of the positions that, new positions to us that we brought on board, the quality programs, pro, Quality program specialist, uh, Marlene, she just actually started last Monday. Uh, emergency response coordinator. Now we need to look at these emergencies and try to have a more uniform way in terms of how we contact staff, how we deal with the, the oversight of these emergencies and so forth. So now every district has an ERC, emergency response coordinator. I already mentioned we're still hiring investigators, that's not consumer safety officers. We're bringing on we bring on more investigators. We got to bring on more compliance people. These are the compliance officers of the staff that that are uh, dealing with the violated reports once they get them. And for bringing on additional investigators, that means we need to have the infrastructure and the training in place and additional supervisors to be able to uh, to deal with the new people that we got coming on. So we're always hiring there. And just today, I was able to announce that. Uh, we, we finally have on board, or, or soon to be on board, our director of compliance branch. That position has been vacant for a little bit over a year in my office, and so, so I'm pleased that we we're able to get somebody to bring them on board rather shortly. I mentioned earlier, before we really kicked off things, I was going to show you the numbers of uh, firms, and this is always a soft number I tell people, about 18, almost 19,000 regulated industry, regulated establishments. And you see the breakout here, uh, just under half of them being foods, uh, the next largest amount being in devices. Uh, Los Angeles District is a big, devi has a huge device inventory, the largest in the country. Most of the device manufacturers are here, out, out in California, where big industry here. Certainly 10% in drugs. And here's the ironic part, I mentioned the largest field office, it's the ironic part. We are not necessarily known as a as a drug district, you know, where that's the your biggest firms and biggest cases out of the drug industry. But we have more high risk drug firms than those districts that are drug uh, that are drug uh, districts. Gives you a, a sense of the, uh, the the amount of numbers. 
concerning animal feeds and and in biologics. And within biologics falls human tissue, and I don't I want to break out human tissues later on because that's a big issue, human tissues. And you may recall, oh I don't know, I, I'm not sure if it was a dateline story or a 60 minute story in which they were harvesting human tissues illegally from uh, cadavers. And soon after that show aired, we did a big, uh, I call it the body snatcher assignment. And we were looking at, um, at, at these tissue banks and how they're getting their tissue product. Because imagine, there are a lot of control for tissue transplant. Imagine if they're harvesting illegally the amount of diseases that that one transplant can cause down, down the line. So the human tissue is a big one. Uh, Arizona, I mentioned earlier that we cover Southern California and Arizona. These are just the numbers for, for, uh, uh, for our friends to the, I guess, to the east of us here. Some of the things, and now these are ORA, Office of Regulatory Affairs highlights. Uh, we have these goals, um, performance-based goals, and their inspectional-based goals. Um, they've been increasing for us, and certainly 20% over 08 for last year. Uh, we had 125 people just focus on PCA, uh, Peanut Corporation of America and Pistachio. Because around the time when peanut happened, we had problems with pistachios. And the one nut that's always in my office, not, I'm not talking about staff, I'm talking about actual nuts. <laughs> it's pistachios. Love pistachios to death. I have to count them out before I eat them. I'll wind up eating the whole pound in one sitting. Imagine my chagrin when we start having problems with pistachio manufacturers and growers. But over 125 people feel why we're dealing with peanut butter issues. That's a lot of people on one issue. And what I said, we need to constantly evaluate how we put risk assessment issues. Hired over 400 investigators in 09. Uh, record number of over 1,200 foreign inspections. Now here is where we are going to grow in terms of what we do. We are going to be needing to do more and more foreign inspections year over year. So represent some 20% increase over the previous um, fiscal year. Um, certainly, the number of legal and public health actions are increasing now. Remember, that, that video you saw earlier was last March. Commission's been on board that, since then, and we have been dealing with RFR issues, reportable food registry issues. We've been dealing with prevention, intervention, and response issues. We have these nine rapid response team issues. We are now moving rapidly on public health issues. So as a, as a result, you would expect those things to, uh, to exceed uh, previous year's level. And I probably expect them as we continue that march on public health enforcement that it will continue to, to grow. And revitalization initiative won't mean so much to you as in-house in terms of how we're looking at how we do our own business practices. What are we doing? Are we doing, the, are we doing things that we did 20 years ago that may not be relevant to what we are today? So that major revitalization after it dealt with uh, over 100 people in the field working on that, on those efforts. Uh, number of recalls we had last year, about 157. That's just in Los Angeles District Office. I don't have that national number. That number would probably be in the hundreds of thousands. Um, remember, the district is a big device area, a big device district. The most, the most of our recalls dealt in device issues, followed by foods, drugs, and followed by foods, biologics, then, uh, then, then drugs. Recalls are classified based on severity, one, two, and three. Class one recalls are the most public health significant ones, followed by class two, then by class three. Class three are the low risk, um, uh, the, the, the low risk of the, of, of the three. Uh, sort of what's new, I don't know if this is new, maybe new to you, so I'll mention it. Um, FDA has been op opening up a number of offices overseas. Uh, China, India, South, Central and South America, Europe and in the Middle East. And these offices, as they open up, they're really uh, uh, our initial entree into some of these areas. And it's not putting investigators over there right away to go out and do inspections on these foreign seas. A lot of these offices, as they're opening up, are really just making uh, the contacts with the government uh, organizations, working on collaborative efforts, as I mentioned earlier, with our regulatory partners on dealing, on dealing with, um, with issues. Um, uh, the, the India office, and I, and I remember this one well because unfortunately it, it was a result 
uh, when they had the, uh, the bombing at the hotel in Mumbai, India. Uh, the commission and the secretary were actually on their way to that office when uh, those bombings occurred. Obviously, they didn't finish the trip um, because of that. Uh, so, so we have these offices overseas. We have a dedicated cadre of people who are here who do foreign inspections. Um, and it's difficult enough to do an inspection domestically, so my hat's off to these individuals who go into foreign countries and do these, uh, these, uh, these foreign inspections. Hey, what's ahead? Uh, certainly, um, the House has passed the uh, Food Safety Enhancement Act. It certainly requires HACCP, Hazard Analysis and Critical Control Point, acronym HACCP. Uh, FTA access to records, ability to acquire mandatory recalls, certainly setting performance standards. These are some of the additional tools that will certainly help us deal with the, the totality of enforcement in, especially in the food protection areas. You know, with the recall. Recall is now voluntary. There are a few program areas in which FDA has the authority to issue uh, mandatory recalls, but, uh, but not many. Sure, we can lean on a company and, and do other things to try and entice them to issue the recall, but if a firm is dead set against issuing a recall, um, we have to do other, other um, enforcement activities to try and deal with getting that bad product off the, uh, off the market. And certainly, as I mentioned, more and more recalls of uh, recalls, more and more foreign inspections. Uh, we're looking to double the number of foreign inspections we're getting in, in the next two years. We double that number. Because all of the reports, all of the studies, all the congressional oversight committees are saying we're not doing enough in the foreign arena and products that are coming over here. We're still a major import country, so a lot of what we do and use is coming over here. I think I'm at my last slide. <laughs> I think we have time for a few questions. Yeah, I, I, I want to answer one that I said that I was going to do, and I actually remember Dr. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, student career yeah. the yes. SCEP program. Internship. Internship program. Why didn't we use that program? I'll tell you why, because almost at the same time as that rolled out, soon after that, this FCIP, Federal Career Internship Program, came out. And it allows us an opportunity to hire directly from the schools. So we don't have to go through the, um, the uh, requirements of the SCEP program. The SCEP program is somebody who's sort of in school, um, didn't quite finish yet, and sort of will, will come in and do like an internship program. Around that time, we were being told, you need to hire 60 people. And since the way the budget works, you know, you get the salary dollars up front, and you need to get those 60 people on board. But well, I didn't have time. We were interviewing I'm 60. I think we were a lot more than that. But we had to bring up so many people. We didn't have the time to deal with two programs at the same time. So we primarily focused purely on the FCI, uh, the FCIP program, Federal Career Internship Program, to bring people on board. And it's essentially hiring, hiring somebody into one of the positions, an investigator, uh, in point, and they'll sort of be under a two-year uh, internship program. Okay. That internship program, you're an employee of the Food and Drug Administration. You are getting your promotions as, as warranted and you're going through training and all that other stuff as a normal employee or regular employee would come on board. And after the two-year uh, internship program to be uh, converted over to a, uh, a permanent position. And so that's uh, the FCIP program. That's why we focused on that. So now, especially over the past two years, we had so many people to bring on board that we didn't look at FCEP. I can tell you that Friday afternoon, I was talking with my administrative officer, and we have some administrative positions that we're trying to fill. In the interim, we were actually talking about SCEP as a possibility for us to be able to bridge that gap. I don't know what's going to ultimately happen, so we really just started having that discussion. But, uh, but SCEP is still there. We haven't used it as yet because of our uses of the FCIP program. Our jobs are advertised on usajobs.com or the .gov, I can't remember which is which. And um, so you will see those positions that, that are advertised there. And it's open, I think. We have an opening. We have, it's advertised right now. We're looking to fill some more positions this fiscal year. 
That was one question I remember from earlier. The others? I, I remember the, um, I think it was dog food or cat food. Uh, mm. Melanie. Yeah, Melanie. And uh, we were wondering how these foreign inspections will occur and giving the severity of punishments in, in China, for example, and, and how that discussion with Right now, in the office that you're opening up in, in China, for example, it's, it's just to explore how this relationship will work. Mm -hmm. not the, the, the office has been open now over a year now. They have, we actually have three, two or three offices throughout, throughout um, China. And initially, um, they are ser ser serving as liaisons. They, technically, these employees work for the State Department in these foreign places. You mentioned melamine. Melamine is a, is a, uh, that's a beautiful case autopsy here, even if you're doing a melamine situation. Obviously, we were able to quickly determine the source of the problem because problems started happening soon after the domestic manufacturer changed suppliers. One supplier A, everything was fine, one supplier B, cats and dogs started to drop dead. So we were able to quickly hone in on there being a problem, not necessarily knowing exactly what the problem was, and that's through science and, and, and testing that came up that the problem was with melamine contamination. It wasn't a, a plot to try and kill the, uh, the dogs and cats of the world. It was more of an economic game, because the wheat gluten, which is um, the basis for a lot of the, the, the pet food, was the, the main protein source, and and the manufacturer paid more for that protein source. So what the melamine does is they do a rather simplistic test to determine uh, protein content, and what the melamine does is give an erroneous, false, high content. That's the reason why the melamine is put to the product. Uh, the effect was obviously disastrous uh, to 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 the to, to, to pet food, but here. The ironic part, and we knew the firm that manufactured. So after about I don't know the timeline, but after some period of time, they finally allowed a delegation from the U.S. to go over to the plant to do an inspection. Anybody care to guess what we found? We got there rubber. They, they bulldozed the plant. They it demolished the plant. Just to demolish the plant. So we weren't able to do an inspection there. Now. You can search YouTube and you'll see, you'll find videos on, you know, how, you know, these coal miners are still using melamine and supplying it to the food industry. I'm going, hmm, why are we doing that? Um, still out there. Uh, after the pet food issue happened, there were reports of the product getting into uh, infant milk in China. I think you may have heard the results of the reports of the deaths associated there. So then we started looking at dairy products, milk products. And you name it, chocolate products, anything that had a milk or cocoa product in it for melamine. <coughs> for melamine. So it's one of those things you wouldn't think of it as being a wheat food, a pet food. You wouldn't think of it as a hybrid situation. I always say you always got to constantly establish and take a look at what you, what's those risky products are. So, question. Thank you very much. I know you're very busy. Um, we find